Welcome back, fellow mitochondriacs, for another episode of Cancer is a Mitochondrial Metabolic Disease. Today, we're going to talk about the pathologic weight loss that is seen in cancer, also known as cancer-related cachexia. The topic is important because it deals directly with cancer-related mortality or cancer-related death. And you're going to see how it ties in to looking at cancer from a metabolic perspective. And so without further ado, let's get into it. So we're going to start off this talk just discussing cancer cachexia as a whole and definitions, criteria, et cetera, and then go into what several different research groups believe are the causes of cancer cachexia, and then going to tie it into how it relates to cancerous metabolic disease. So the first paper that I picked was titled Cancer Cachexia, New Insights and Future Directions, and it was published in November of 2023. And it says here that cancer remains a major health problem and is associated with cachexia in up to 80% of cases, leading to decreased survival and quality of life. Cachexia involves complex metabolic disturbances in both protein and energy balance, muscle wasting phenomenon, weight loss, systemic inflammation, overall decreased performance status, and tolerability to treatment. The clinical impact of cancer cachexia is very complex. With early detection of cachectic patients and identification of predictive biomarkers being two key factors for improving survival. Thus, a better understanding of the complexity of cancer cachexia phenomena and its main pathophysiologic mechanisms is much needed. Our review highlights the most important information about cancer cachexia aimed to disseminate updated research findings about this highly deadly condition. So let's take a look at this graphic that accompanies the paper. And it says here that we have the, you know, the pathophysiology or the, the physiology or the disease physiology associated with this abnormal pathologic weight loss, also known as cachexia. And you see that it breaks down into, at least the paper breaks it down into three different sub mechanisms. We have metabolic dysregulation, we have a negative energy balance, aka a caloric deficit, and we have also both neurotransmitter and hormonal imbalances as well, which ultimately all contribute to weight loss, muscle mass loss, possible fat mass loss, systemic inflammation, and that leads to decreased survival, increased treatment-related toxicities, and just a general poor quality of life. So let's dig into the paper. So it says here that Cancer is the leading cause of death in people age 40 to 79 years old and is associated with cachexia in up to 80% of patients, depending on the cancer type. At least 20% of cancer patients will die due to cancer cachexia. Systemic inflammation and exacerbation of catabolic processes are usually associated. Cancer induces metabolic disturbances, leading to sympathetic activation, decreased gonadal function, insulin resistance, and tumor-induced systemic inflammation. All these changes coupled with poor food intake lead to muscle wasting, decreased performance status, and tolerability to treatment, and in the end, death of the patient. Going further into de to the definition section, it says cachexia is a complex metabolic syndrome associated with an underlying illness and characterized by loss of muscle with or without loss of fat mass. The key part of this definition was at least 5% body weight loss in the last 12 months or less corrected for fluid retention. And then it talks about here in the same year, you know, 2008, they had like their first diagnostic criteria that was set and it included in addition and above, above and beyond the 5% of weight loss in less than 12 months um, in the presence of an underlying disease, plus three of any of the following. So if you had any level of fatigue, if you had anorexia or loss of appetite and weight loss, if you had abnormal biochemical lab markers, increased inflammatory markers, C-reactive protein, greater than five milligrams per liter, interleukin-6, greater than four picograms per milliliter, anemia, hemoglobin of 12 or less, or a low serum albumin of 3.2 grams per deciliter or less. You had a low fat-free mass index and decreased muscle strength. In 2011, Cachexia was redefined as a multifactorial syndrome defined by an ongoing loss of skeletal muscle mass with or without loss of fat mass, 
that can be partially but not entirely reversed by conventional nutritional support. And it says here they have a new criteria, revised criteria, weight loss of greater than 5% over the past six months. So they've shortened it from 12 months to six months. BMI of less than 20 or any degree of weight loss greater than 2%. And then appendicular skeletal muscle mass index consistent with sarcopenia and any degree of weight loss greater than 2%. And then finally, in 2019, this Cedar Home group published an updated definition of cancer cachexia based on the consensus report from the global clinical nutrition community. Cachexia was redefined as chronic disease-related malnutrition with associated inflammatory changes. The diagnostic criteria involved one etiologic criterion from reduced food intake slash assimilation or inflammation slash disease burden and one phenotypic criterion for involuntary weight loss, low BMI, or low muscle mass. According to Rear et al., Cachexia involves a wasting process of both muscle and fat mass. So now they've included both muscle and fat, although previously it was not needed for there to be any fat mass loss, unintentional weight loss, systemic inflammation, and the presence of a malignant process or chronic disease. A lot of times you'll see cachexia and other diseases like COPD, emphysema, like end-stage disease there. Despite the above mentioned variations in the de definitions of cachexia, its clinical course follows three main stages. Number one, a pre cachexic stage, the first stage of the disease characterized by minor weight loss, anorexia, and glucose intolerance. This is important. Cachexia, the second stage of disease progression involving the unintentional weight loss of greater than 5% within six months, sarcopenia, and unintentional weight loss of greater than 2% in patients with a BMI of less than 20. And then number three is refractory cachexia, the last stage of the disease, which has decreased reversibility and is associated with life expectancy below three months. Wow. So that begs the question, what is the difference between cachexia and sarcopenia? So I clipped out a little snippet of that as well. So it says, muscle mass loss is seen in different catabolic conditions, which share the common feature of muscle wasting. Although there are similarities between sarcopenia and cachexia and sometimes overlap, they are two different clinical entities and should be clearly distinguished. The term sarcopenia comes from the Greek derivation sarco, meaning flesh, and penia meaning poverty or loss. Therefore, sarcopenia means loss of muscle. Sarcopenia is defined as a geriatric condition in which there is low muscle mass combined with low muscle strength or decreased physical performance. Cachexia, on their hand, is a more severe entity in which there is wasting of both muscle and fat mass, remember that's a new part of the definition, which associated with weight loss and systemic inflammation in the presence of malignant process or chronic disease. Cachexia is a complex combination of both fat and muscle loss, hyperlipidemia, hyperglycemia, and inflammatory disturbances. Most of the cachectic individuals have sarcopenia, but not all sarcopenic patients are cachectic. And they include a definition of each cachexia and sarcopenia, and they put on a little table here so you can compare and contrast the differences in the diagnostic criteria, definitions, and high-risk con conditions that are associated with each of those disease processes. So let's talk quickly about the pathophysiologic mechanisms of cancer cachexia according to this paper that was published in 2023. The exact mechanism by which cancer cachexia leads to muscle atrophy is not completely understood. Numerous studies have focused on a better understanding of this complex metabolic process aiming to improve patients' quality of life and overall survival. Decreased skeletal muscle protein synthesis and increased degradation processes take place during cancer cachexia. Molecules like pro-inflammatory cytokines, transcription factors, insulin-like growth factor 1, kinases, proteins, and abnormal expression of angiotensin 2 are involved in the complex process of cancer cachexia. The three main mechanisms involved in the, in the pathophysiologic mechanisms of cancer cachexia are metabolic deregulation, negative energy balance, which lead to weight loss, increased proteolysis and lipolysis, and neurohormonal imbalances. So let's first take a look at their explanation about cytokines and how this ties in. This says here that the interaction between the tumor and the body's tissues leads to a systemic inflammatory response. Systemic inflammation is associated with a negative nitrogen balance or kind of a decrease in available amino acids for muscle building, et cetera. Increased energy consumption, so having a systemic inflammation actually costs energy, and weight loss. A systemic inflammatory response leads to a progressive impairment of the functional and nutritional status of the patient a poor prognosis, and decreased survival of cachectic cancer patients. The activation of the humoral immune system and the secretion of tumor 
cell-derived cytokines such as tumor necrosis factor alpha, TNF alpha, interferon gamma, interleukin 1 beta, IL 1 beta, and interleukin 6 are part of the pathophysiology of cancer-related cachexia. Immune cells such as neutrophils, macrophages, T cells, and bone marrow-derived suppressor cells are also involved in cancer cachexia pathogenesis. It then talks about lipolysis, proteolysis, and cachexia. It says here that cancer cachexia leads to weight loss due to both muscle and adipose tissue loss. Again, this is the updated version where muscle and, pro and fat loss are both seen. Increased muscle protein catabolism or breakdown promoted mainly by ATP-driven ubiquitin proteolytic pathway and to a lesser extent, the other proteolytic pathways such as the calcium calpain pathway and lysosomal cathepsins B, H, F, and L are involved in cancer cachexia. Two major atrophy-related genes, atrogen-1 and MuRF1, are also cited. Cancer-induced cytokine formation leads to the reduction of myoblast determination, protein-1, myoD, a transcription factor involved in muscle development leading to a muscle wasting. Adipose tissue and skeletal muscle wasting are strongly interrelated as functional lipolysis induces muscle wasting by promoting excess oxidation of free fatty acids and skeletal muscle and release of adipokines, among which leptin seems to be the most important in the context of cancer cachexia. And it has a little graphic here showing what they're talking about here. So we have cancer cachexia as a whole, and that's a combination of both increased protein breakdown and increased fat breakdown. And you see here that there's low muscle regeneration, there's these, there's these muscle atrophy related genes that are activated. There's cytokines that decrease this myoD protein. There's increased catabolic activity because of the activation of proteolithic pathways. And then there's low muscle differentiation and low muscle growth, which ultimately leads to the muscle loss seen in, in, in cancer-related cachexia. And then there's increased lipolysis or the breakdown of fat tissue as well. And so there's adipose breakdown or catabolism. There's loss of white adipose tissue. There's there's increased levels of this LMF. There's tuber factor, zinc, alpha-2, glycoprotein activation, most of which I'm not familiar with the biochemistry there or the cell biology, but these are the factors that these researchers have found that are involved in the, both the muscle and fat loss. And this is, believe it or not, this is actually still from a pretty high level. We're not looking at the actual mechanisms of what lead to this, in my opinion. It also talks about mitochondrial dysfunction being important here, it says that mitochondrial changes during cancer cachexia are still understudied. According to Lim et al., mitochondrial oxidative stress processes and reactive oxygen species generation precede the development of cancer cachexia in tumor-bearing mice. There is an impairment of mitochondrial dynamics, autophagy, mitochondrial quality control, and reduced content of mitochondrial fusion regulatory proteins. The role of mitochondria in cancer cachexia pathogenesis was also discussed by this other research group. And it says that mitochondrial alterations led to a poor mitochondrial quality and activity, malfunctions of mitochondrial metabolism and oxidative phosphorylation processes, DNA damage, and altered mitochondrial dynamics. If you're not familiar with mitochondrial dynamics, I have a video, a whole, a whole series of videos actually on the mitochondrial dynamics. That would be like fission, fusion, mitochondrial mitophagy, and mitochondrial biogenesis. Definitely not some of my more popular videos, but they are important to understanding these processes and how they contribute to cancer formation. And then lastly, gut microbiota and cachexia. Gut microbiota changes are related to muscle atrophy by affecting skeletal muscle homeostasis. Gut microbiota produces metabolites like endoxyl sulfate, which is thought to be a cause of muscle atrophy and urothelian A, which is related to increased mitophagy in skeletal muscles. So here it's showing that there's mitochondrial dysfunction and cachexia. Basically, what we have here is the factors that are leading to decreased mitochondrial function, impaired mitochondrial quality control, increased oxidative stress, ROS. I see these as one and the same. Impaired mitochondrial dynamics. This is also related to quality control. And then we have dysfunction, which leads to decreased mitochondrial quality, decreased mitochondrial fusion regulatory proteins, mitochondrial and nuclear DNA damage, which leads to a bioenergetic performance in those tissues as well, and increasing mitochondrial heteroplasmy. Then it talks about how these all relate to the appetite center and cachexia. So it says the pathophysiology of appetite regulation in cancer patients is still under debate. Two sets of neurons located in the arcuate nucleus of the hypothalamus are involved. The neuropeptide Y directly simulates appetite or by releasing other orexigenic proteins and the melanocortin system POMC basically, leading to the decreased food-seeking behavior and lean body mass and increased 
basal metabolic rate. In cancer patients, the production of inflammatory cytokines degrades the balance of the appetite center. Substances like leptin, ghrelin, and growth differentiation factor 15, GDF15 are involved. Cancer alters zinc homeostasis, and as a consequence of the acute phase response to inflammation, cytokines activity, low zinc levels are associated with hypojusia or decreased taste, thus further contributing to the low food appetite and anorexia in cancer patients. Lactate is also involved in the pathophysiologic mechanism of cancer cachexia. Increased levels of lactate are found in cachectic patients, lactate being an anorexic agent. In addition, cachexic patients are also experiencing high plasma levels of tryptophan, the precursor to serotonin. Serotonin negatively influences food intake by activating anorexigenic neurons like POMC, pro-opio melanocortin, and cocaine and amphetamine regulatory transcript, CART, in the melanocortin system. And it gives us a little graphic here of how the appetite center has changed. It then talks about like, what is the clinical impact of cancer cachexia? And it says cancer cachexia has a complex clinical impact and dramatically affects patients' quality of life. Multiple molecules are involved in cancer-related cachexia, varying from cytokines, neurotransmitters, tumor-derived factors, and neuropeptides. High levels of C-reactive protein, interleukin-6, interleukin-10 are associated with poor performance, weight loss, and worse prognosis in cancer patients. And then it gives some other interesting information. So it talks about the clinical impact on a systems-based level. And I wanted to highlight in particular the endocrine and metabolic dysfunctions. Before we get there, let's talk about muscle mass and cachexia. It says that muscle homeostasis affected in cachectic patients lead to reduced muscle mass and strength. Muscle depletion is the most important clinical feature of cancer cachexia. Cancer-related muscle atrophy has been extensively studied. However, there is still no concrete understanding of it. Muscle wasting is linked to physical impairment, reduced tolerance to treatments, and decreased overall survival rates. And what I really wanted to talk about from this graphic, and that's why I highlighted on the graphic, was the endocrine and metabolic dysfunctions. I think this totally ties into some of the things that we see and difficulties we see with employing metabolic therapy in particular. So it says cancer cachexia is associated with imbalances of glucose metabolism with insulin resistance being frequently associated. Insulin resistance in cancer patients is different from the one in type 2 diabetes mellitus, it is characterized by normal fasting glucose levels associated with any insulin level. This phenomenon can be explained by the use of glucose by tumoral cells to promote cancer cell growth. Insulin dysregulation is a common host adaption to cancer growth, but cachexia significantly interests only a variety of cancer types, according to the published study of Dev et al. 2018. The concept of insulin resistance and insulin sensitivity in cancer patients is still controversial as insulin resistance was ascribed in some types of cancer and the early stages of cachexia in mouse models, whereas other studies showed no correlation between cancer patients' cachexia and insulin resistance. There are also differences in insulin sensitivity between cancer patients with or without associated cachexia due to hormonal imbalances, vitamin D, testosterone, GLP-1, glucagon, ghrelin, apelin, and adipose tissue modifications. Cancer cachexia also impacts pancreatic exocrine function and digestive enzyme secretion. Their dysregulation directly influences nutrient absorption, gut microbiome, and function as it is directly linked to adipose tissue wasting, thus promoting weight loss in cancer patients. Catabolic and glycolytic processes are upregulated in cachectic patients, leading to increased plasma levels of amino acids and lactate. These products will further stimulate gluconeogenesis process, causing increased glucose levels needed for tumor growth, according to the study published by Lim et al. Hey everybody, pardon the red lights, but I don't mess around with blue light at night to protect my melatonin. I realized when I was editing this video here in the studio that this video is about an hour and 10 minutes long. And I realized also that that is gonna be difficult to get through all in one setting. So I decided to break it up into about two, if not three different videos where it can be given in kind of digestible chunks, and I can slowly tie this into cancer as a metabolic disease and how it relates directly to ketogenic metabolic therapy and how that becomes a big strategy on how to overcome cancer-related cachexia. So if you like videos like this, please like, share, and subscribe. Until next time.